So I had about three days last week that I got to do a little bit more work on the horizontal stabilizer. And when I left off the week before in the last video that you saw, I was sadly under the delusion that I only had a few more holes to dimple, countersink, and drill out before I was gonna be ready to take all of this stuff here and get it primed and then get it all put together. And I thought I'd just be making a video now where I picked up after priming everything and starting on the assembly process for all this fun stuff here. Now, while I did have a few more holes <laughs> that needed some drilling out than I, I thought, uh, a lot of the time really got eaten up with everyone's favorite task and mine, of course, which is deburring. On the days that I come out here to work on the airplane, I'm typically out here four to five hours and I spent three days last week out here working on it. And of those three days that I was out here, I can, easily say that at least half of that time was just spent deburring holes, smoothing out edges, fluting a lot of the uh, ribs, and all that fun stuff. The rest of the time was the actual drilling and countersinking that I thought I could do in probably like a day or something like that. So anyway, severely underestimated what was contained in about two pages of instructions. It just always looks like so much less time than you would think when you look at the plans. I mean, literally, it was about three or four steps on two pages of the instructions uh, that took me three days to accomplish, so go figure. But anyway, I got all that stuff done last week, so now everything here on the table needs to get prepped for priming, so I'll use the pre-coat solution with a 3M Scotch-Brite and get it all scuffed up and then ready to be primed. So while I do that, here's a look at everything that I did last week to get all of this stuff to this point. So in the last video, I think one of the things that I talked about was I had those few holes and things to drill and then I was gonna get that skin on there and do that test fit, but I was able to go through, check the skins, check the spar holes that match up to the skin, check the uh, holes in all the ribs that match up to the skin as well, and everything has been punched to final size and matched up. So that saves me a lot of time. It also means that I did not have to continue with clecoing everything together and clecoing the skin in place and doing all that match drilling. So that was some stuff that I thought I was gonna have to do and would have put in uh, this video. Um, but happily don't have to do that. So as I mentioned in some other videos, the RV-14 and the RV-10, most of the stuff with those is coming punched to final size as far as the skins and then the flanges on the ribs and spars where they match up that. There's still some other holes that need to be upsized or match drilled where parts connect together, but they've really been able to refine the process with the RV-10 and 14 to get these holes both final sized and matched when they punch them out of the factory. The reason in the past you would not have holes that were final size is because you want to put the material together. You want the holes to be like one size smaller than their final size so that when you put two pieces together, if those holes don't line up perfectly, that's fine because you're going to put them all together with Clecos, then you're going to upsize them all together by one drill size, which means any slight tolerance that's there is taken up when you final size those holes. But they've gotten so good at the factory now with the RV-10, the RV-14 kits, that they can go ahead and send this stuff out where the holes have been punched to final size and they're also perfectly aligned when you click them all together. So that's great news. Saves me a lot of time as the builder. So there's that. Moving on. So where I picked up in the plans after the last video, the next step was to modify the center two nose ribs and inspar ribs. These are the ones that will ultimately create the inboard edge of the left and right halves of the horizontal stabilizer. These edges follow the taper in the tail of the aircraft, and because of that, these parts need to attach to the spars at an angle. So following the plans, the nose ribs have a 10 degree angle built into the rear flanges where they attach to the front spar. Meanwhile, the inspar ribs are a little bit more complicated. The aft flange of each is bent to 10 degrees, where it attaches to the rear spar. And the front flanges need to be bent to a 12 and a half degree angle for attaching it to the back of the front spar. But 
you also have to put a two and a half degree bend into the web of the rib. Overall, the process isn't really too difficult. It just takes a little bit of time to get the angles right. So I've got this little digital protractor kind of thing that I picked up at Home Depot for, I don't know, five or 10 bucks. Works out really nice because you can set the angle between the two straight edges and then you can kind of crank down the locking ring to kind of hold it in position and then line it up against the flanges on these ribs to make sure you've got the angle right. And then next up, I get to start drilling all those holes that I originally thought I was going to knock out in just a few hours. So I Clico the nose and the inspar ribs that I just modified to the front and the back of the front spar. There are a few holes in the flanges of each that need to be drilled to match up with the holes in the spar. And there's also a few holes that don't get drilled, dimpled, or riveted later on. So I mark those holes. Those will eventually get screws, and this is where a fairing is going to attach on the outside. This will cover the gap between the horizontal stabilizer and the tail cone later on. With the holes done, I mark all the parts so that I can reassemble them correctly later on, pull those all apart. And now the holes in the flanges of all of these ribs, both the inspar and the nose ribs, get deburred and dimpled where the skins will eventually attach to those. So I did just get to a part in the instructions where things were a little bit vague. Looking at step five here on page seven where I'm getting ready to dimple all of the nose ribs and inspar ribs. And there were a couple in step four where those two center inspar ribs you're called out not to put dimples on there about five holes between the inspar ribs and those nose ribs. And that's pretty simple. So we taped over that. Then in step five, you're going to go ahead and dimple all the holes in all of the nose ribs and all of the inspar ribs. Then there's the note above that that says not to dimple the holes that were marked in step two or the small holes on the inspar ribs. When we get to step five, it says to dimple all the holes on the modified and the non-modified. So my thought was on the remaining inspar ribs and nose ribs, uh, we dimple all the holes. Then I thought, well, am I supposed to also not dimple those holes that we didn't dimple on the center ones or not? Not sure. So I went ahead in the instructions to find out why those are undimpled. And it turns out that those ones in the middle, that's where the, the fairing is going to get screwed in. So it's just those holes that don't get modified. So that was cleared up. That was pretty easy. But then the question became, on the 1004 inspar ribs, which are these guys that are the ones that just go about the width of where the doubler is on the spar and where the stringers are, it says don't dimple the small tab on these or the small tab on the other ribs as well. So that's pretty easy. That's the nose one. And that's because that's what goes up into the spar. So that was clear. But then as I was starting to dimple along, I came to this little tab. This one doesn't have that tab, but this one does. And I'm like, well, it's a small tab. Does it mean all small tabs or just the ones that are in the front? So to figure that out, I put this together. So these are the stringers. Only the 1004 inspar ribs attached to these stringers. So those small holes are where the stringers get attached in. I have confirmed that it is these small holes we don't dimple because that's where it attaches into the spar. And these small holes don't get dimpled because that's where it attaches to the stringer. So, move it on. Where the skins are gonna to attach to the flanges on the front and the rear spars, all of those holes in the spars need to be countersunk to match the dimples in the skin. There are a lot of these holes, and that definitely took quite a bit of time. Similarly, the stringers, which hold the six center inspar ribs together, all those holes that are gonna to attach to the skin also need to be countersunk. So with everything marked and deburred, now I can pull out the C-frame and dimple both skins. After reading ahead in the rest of the instructions, I confirm that this completes any holes which need to be countersunk, 
dimpled or drilled out. All the remaining holes are final sized and matched. So at this point, I just disassemble everything that I've got Clico together and now I can get ready to prime. Remember how I said that the prep before painting takes a lot longer than the priming itself does? Four solid hours it took to spray on the pre-coat and rub all this stuff down with the scotch Bright pad to take off the finish, go from shiny aluminum to all scuffed up aluminum so that now I can proceed with actually priming everything. <laughs> so yeah, it's a lot of work. Okay, priming's done. It sucks, it's hot, <sighs> but it's done. <sighs> Moving on. So that's kind of it for this video. I know it's a short one, just wanted to get something out there to keep you guys up to date on the progress of it. Hope you enjoyed it. As always, thanks so much for watching. Please hit the like button if you haven't already, and we'll see you on the next video.